uh, first of our kind. Mm -hmm. okay. I just sorry, something came saying that we are being recorded. So it's wonderful we are recording. Yes, but I, I remember. Not... Thanks, Liz Karani. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, everyone for joining us. Uh, it's good to see faces that I recognize from the classroom, from the department, and even from within the university. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are really privileged actually to have your company. Um, and it's a, it's a, we're just trying something brand new, thanks to the COVID. You never know, we'll be having lectures like this and we can interact uh, from your living room. So thank you very, very much for joining us and uh, let us begin. Over back to you, Alice. Okay, thank you very much, Mary. And so we'll just start with, um, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to share a slide. No, I need to please mute yourself. Okay, so to start, I'll just share my screen and show you some one or two slides. This is COVID-19. Slide share. Hmm. Excuse me, trying to figure out my IT. Uh, slide show from beginning. So my name is Dr. Ojuang Alice, and I work for Technical University, Department of Human Nutrition and Dietetics. So today, we're interested in talking about COVID-19 because COVID-19 has prevented a lot, has presented a lot of challenges. And these are serious times, to be honest. The challenges are, um, uh, people's lives have been turned around. You didn't know you could be sitting at home for a month, a lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people um, are wondering what, where, how is, when is this going to be? Where am I going to get my, my next food? And um, it's really just challenging. So, of course, because of this session, we are really going, we are more interested in health. But just so that we are together, how has this pandemic affected you? Maybe just send, just send a message on the chat. How has the pandemic affected you personally as an individual? Could you please share with us? Send a message, otherwise you can uh, unmute and talk. Well, I'm sure it has affected people in many ways, but um, when it comes to health, what the literature is saying now, coronavirus is bringing to the forefront how dangerous it is to be unhealthy. Because in the countries where people have died, Italy, America, Spain, what people are talking about, yes, we hear that the old people have died, but that's not all. Even young people are actually dying. And now more than ever, it has also proven that being obese and having chronic conditions, maybe diabetes and hypertension, is also extremely dangerous. Because the statistics are showing that death rates for obese people are comparable to the death rates of smokers. So can you imagine that? It was, we all, we've, all, we've always known it is more dangerous for a smoker and they're more likely to die of uh, upper respiratory tract infections or any problems related to, uh, um, to lungs and oxygen related complications. But it is showing that death rates for obese people are just the same as people who are smokers if they're infected with corona. 
Also, what is surprising, and especially this has been reported in the, U in the U.S., younger adults who are obese are likely to die as older people who have contracted the virus. So if you are young and obese, then you're just, if you contract that virus, you're just as likely to die as an older person. So COVID-19 is highlighting the seriousness of being unhealthy. So in this time, of course, we have to think about it. How is my health? What is my weight? Am I being, um, have I been paying attention to my health? And for maybe people who are here who are nutrition professionals, what are you going to do to help your community and people in your neighborhood? So I will just stop there. And so if you have any question, then please feel free to ask. We have just highlighted that uh, coronavirus has brought to the forefront how dangerous it is to be unhealthy. We are yet to talk about the immune system, but the statistics have shown that when you're overweight, when you have chronic conditions like diabetes and hypertension, maybe even high cholesterol, it doesn't matter what age you are. You're at a high risk of dying as a smoker and also as just that old person who is 70 years old or 80 years old. So that means we have to rethink our health. And we have not even talked about um, uh, your immune system yet. We've just talked about being obese. So I had asked people to send questions about how they feel about uh, coronavirus. And I have some comments from everybody. Somebody says that I have lost my job. I'm very sorry to hear that. Someone else says, I couldn't be there for my grandmother's burial because of movement restrictions. And of course, other people are just saying, thank you for having this, all right? So, thank you for that. So do we have any comments in relation to the introduction we've just covered in relation to um, COVID-19 and our health status? Please remember, if you have a question, um, please put your hand up or send a comment. Okay, I see a question here. How widespread is obesity in Kenya? So Mary, would you like to answer that question? Alice, you are the expert in obesity. Don't put me on the spot, please. So I refer the, back, uh, the question back to you. I know the obesity is uh, very prevalent and it carries a lot of comorbidities, which are really disturbing our populations uh, with, um, uh, what did I say? With uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, even the skeletal, uh, uh, skeleton is affected. So it's really a growing problem in our society. Right now, I don't have very many. Mary, sorry, I think I muted you. Mary, go ahead. Okay. Amaya, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Alice, you've put me on the spot again because you are the expert in obesity, but let me take a stab at it. Obesity is really growing uh, exponentially in our society as we adopt more westernized uh, ways of eating, especially the high salt, high fat food. Uh, and we are sitting for longer periods. And with that said, our society is getting more sicker with diabetes, with a high blood pressure, and all the comor comorbidities that uh, obesity brings. And as a result, we are spending a lot of money uh, to tackle this. 
So Alice, I will uh, ask you to add on to this because you are the expert in this. And I, also, I just want to say it is a big problem, especially for children. Childhood obesity is growing in our society in ways that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary, for that. I just wanted to share this because we are working together as a team here. So obesity is a growing problem in Kenya. We cannot compare the statistics to the, to the U.S., or other developing countries, but it has become a problem here. Let me give you an example. Not too long ago, we did a survey in uh, five corporate organizations, just looking at people's body mass index. And I uh, say we had about 750 participants. And from that, one, from that just from that small uh, population of uh, two corporate organizations, we had a good 49% of people aged between 26 to 40, I think it was about 47 or 49 years, they were all obese and all of them had something else. They had either, they had metabolic syndrome, so either they were obese with a high waist circumference and they had either impaired glucose tolerance, which in their, meaning that their blood sugar was high, their uh, random blood sugar was high, not yet diabetes, but just before diabetes. So that meant that if they didn't change their lifestyle, then you're going to have a problem. I'm not sure about the current statistics, sorry, I'm not up to date on that. But the last time I checked, which was maybe five years ago before I left Kenya, now I'm back, I'll be up to date, I promise. Obesity in adults was at 15%, which is actually very high. But we live in a city and everywhere you look, you will see an obese person. When you go to the supermarket, you will see an obese child. So it is a problem and because our lifestyles have changed, yes, it is a problem. And then I also see a question here. Um, uh, challenge now is every cough or chest congestion is scary. You think it's COVID-19. How do we restore our sanity? I think, thank you very much, Professor Akuno, for that um, uh, um, question. I think people need to be, people, uh, I think the government and the health professionals have done a lot in educating people about the symptoms of COVID-19. And so what I would say is we have to know what are the symptoms of getting, of, of, um, what are the symptoms of getting infected? And so if you educate me, educate one more person so that people are not scared. But because this pandemic has made everybody sit at home, uh, there's lockdown, you can't go everywhere. So definitely every cough is going to be scary but not every cough is COVID-19. I don't know, Professor Akuna, would you like to add something? Thank you. Um, mm. I, I, think it's, I, I think a lot of people are even scared of going to the hospital. Yes. Because first of all, the minute you step there, this, this um, um, uh, thermometer is, is, is brought to you and your temperature is taken and you just get goodness, it, maybe I have malaria. If I have malaria, I believe my temperature will be high. So what happens if my temperature is a little higher than normal, so I'm set aside, I'm tested, and, and then what? So um, I think what you say is, is, is about the knowledge. We, I think we just need to be bold enough to, to appreciate that, uh, as you mentioned, not every cough, not every sneezing, is COVID-19. However, mm. however, now mm. that we have this with us, mm. can we be brave enough to go right ahead and, and, and uh, seek the medical attention that we might need? Mm. Again, as you mentioned, that those of us who have other conditions are perhaps a lot more vulnerable Maybe those of us who have these diseases that my grandmother used to say she was walking with, mm -hmm. those of us who have these conditions that we have been walking with, maybe it is time we got them sorted out so that mm -hmm. in case we are exposed to them, to not just this particular virus, but any other virus, mm -hmm. we may not be too vulnerable to it. I am speaking as an exceedingly lay person in things nutrition mm -hmm. and health. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I, I see experts on, uh, you know, in the, on the platform. As, as a, a layperson, 
I mm. know there's a lot of fear out there. There's mm-hmm. a lot of anxiety out there. And I think when people like yourselves talk to us, we get a lot more empowered. Mm-hmm. We can make certain decisions about our lifestyle that should strengthen us against any viral attack that might come our way. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Akuno, and we are very happy that you've joined us today. So um, just before I let Mutegi maybe make a comment, he's a public health professional, I'll just say the common symptoms of, of, of uh, COVID-19 is fever, tiredness, but what has been known is the dry cough. The cough is dry. It's not your co- normal cough that produces mucus. So that's the difference. So if you have the regular flu and you have a cough, you're producing mucus, then you shouldn't worry. But it will still just good to take precautions, as Professor Kuna said. But that is what it's really known for. It is, um, it is, please, if you've joined the meeting, just mute yourself. Thank you very much. And, um, and then some people may also experience aches and pains. They will uh, experience nasal congestion, runny nose, sore throat and diarrhea, which is something that is coming out. And this, of course, we have, most people have experienced uh, symptoms in US, in Italy and Spain, but uh, this, is, this, is, this is what you get from the WHO website. So I'm sure you know all these symptoms, but we are just letting you, um, um, we're just repeating because somebody has asked. So uh, Mr. Mutegi, Oh, Ms. Mutegi, would you like to say something about um, uh, coronavirus and related deaths? Hello, you can hear me? Yes, please introduce yourself and thank you for joining us. Yeah, my name is Mutegi Kevin. I'm a registered nutritionist, but also have um, some much experience in community health and a number of uh, areas in surveys and surveillance. So yeah. with regards to the pandemic we have, um, what we are seeing is that uh, since the first discovery in China and the distribution of deaths, uh, the first case of deaths in China and distribution of deaths across various continents, mm. um, with most affected being USA, Europe, and from there, we are able to see a number of researches with regards to obesity. It's true. Mm. Uh, the fact is that uh, some of these countries um, in Europe, as well as USA, the obesity uh, rates is, uh, are quite very high as mm. compared to uh, Kenya, for example, or any other country in sub-Saharan Africa. However, what we, we need to acknowledge is that there might be quite a number of gaps in uh data as well as information with regards to does the is it related for example all the deaths related to covid is it related uh specifically for obese people aggregated in with different sexes or ages Mm -hmm. Uh, are we able to see the distribution of patterns of these deaths specifically uh especially in africa where we have some sort of double burden of malnutrition, both overweight obesity as well as undernutrition. Mm. And if you look at the challenges now we have in Africa, for example, uh, with regards to the pandemic, uh, there's still huge gaps even to ensure that mass testing, ensure that uh, support and treatment, uh, sorry, support and management of COVID cases, both nutrition and other health, health, health aspects, as well as prevention is maintained. So this quit a lot of gap and um, I'm appreciative of this uh, platform and bringing people together f- to share knowledge, to discuss as well as um, mitigate efforts on how uh, some of these information will be vital to our systems uh, in mm. Kenya as well as other countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mutegi. So, um, and of course, your question was in regards to obesity. In Africa, we have not seen many, many deaths. And uh, as much as the, the early, pre- early statistics show that we might not have serious issues, we don't know. But what we know, because of this pandemic, it is now very clear. If you're unhealthy, 
and you get infected, you will suffer the consequences. And shortly, we are going to look at, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to have an immune system? What does it mean to be healthy? If you're obese, we've always known being an obese person, you have risk factors for diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease, and you also have musculoskeletal issues like backache. But now we know with COVID-19, you will also have a very serious, uh, 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 you have a very serious risk of getting um, uh, problems with your lungs and or let's say upper respiratory tract infection. If you get the upper respiratory tract infections, you will be, uh, you will be in, in big trouble. Let's just say that. But we did not want to spend too much talking about the COVID and the symptoms and everything. What we've talked about is, is was just an introduction. So now we'd like to ask, um, if there's no further comment or question, then I'm going to let uh, Dr. Mugambi tackle the next topic, which is uh, food security. But I see somebody asking a question. What are your thoughts about the dream of a miracle medicine from Bungoma Girl? We're going to answer this when you're talking about the immune system. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mary, for your session. So the next session is actually, um, if I can just share the program. So this is the program. So the first part was uh, introduction, the challenges, COVID-19 pandemic and challenges is presents. And now we are going to go to Mary and she'll talk about nutrition and food security at home. Thank you very much. Mary, you're welcome, Dr. Mugambe. Dr. Mugambi, please go ahead. I had, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. I'm still a techno, what to say, I'm learning the technology. However, I want to thank everybody for joining us in this first of our kind uh, meeting. And um, my topic is really as uh, food security. I want to begin by just uh, saying that food security at the national level and at the county level we can't do anything much about it it's for the government to to do that it's a, a national problem but what can you do at your household level what can you do to cushion your yourself and your family against food insecurity so usually i when i'm asked that question i always begin by introducing the topic of a food reserve box and i'd like to uh, just bring a picture let me see if i can get it on screen and as i talk about it uh it will make more sense can ever alice can you see that can everybody see that not yet not yet oh there we go Oh, there it comes. Okay. When I talk about a food box, I tell people when, when you get your salary or when you have plenty in your pocket, you've got to start thinking about the times when you are not going to have much towards the end of the month, the third and the fourth week. The first and second week of the month, when you have plenty after your salary or pocket money, when you go shopping, just buy what we call from the micro economies. This, for the, for the record, this is a neighbor's uh, food reserve box. And when they go to the supermarket, they use, do their usual shopping of their jogo, of their maize meal, the oil and all, but then in the end, they always get a smaller package of beans, uh, milk, just small, small packet, even of milk, uh, or long life milk. And towards the end of the month, they have these three boxes put aside. I always say put these boxes in places where you cannot see them, in a dry, cool place, in a cupboard where you can't easily access them. And when the go, uh, tough gets, uh, when times become very tough, your salary is delayed, there's no money in the pocket, that's when you get to your food reserve box. And I mean, this is just one month's supply. 
And surely this is enough for, for a family of four or five people for at least a week or two. So that's where I would say you could start uh, cushioning yourself and your family or making your family food secure. Okay, I see if I can go. Okay, Alice, is that? There we go. Mm. <laughs> so the other three small uh, tips I have for you is a little bit on uh, food preservation. Now, we always go to buy our vegetables and these are perishables. And the question I'm always asked is how can I make these perishables last longer? If, especially if they are moving faster and faster and faster. And I always say, cut those, let's say you go to buy your skuma wiki for today and you buy for the week or for two weeks and you've got a refrigerator at home. Cut those extra vegetables, let's say the skuma wiki, the spinach, after you've washed them, and then boil water and uh, put the skuma wiki in a bowl, a big basin, and pour the boiling water and let them stand for four minutes. And this is called blanching. You blanch the vegetables. And after four minutes, you drain the vegetables and let them cool down. And there you are, you've got a whole month's supply of vegetables. You just put uh, the blanched vegetables in um, uh, plastic freezer bags and you deep freeze. And so week one, you've got your skuma wiki. Week two, you've got your spinach. Week three, you've got your other skuma wiki. So you don't have to keep going to the mamamboga every time. And when there's no money, well, you don't, doesn't mean that you don't have vegetables. The next uh, small point I would like to say is uh, drying, drying. And you're going to ask me, okay, Mary, we are living in um, concrete jungle. How do I dry my vegetables if I live in an apartment, in a hostel? And it's so very simple. The same way I've described the blanching the vegetables, you cut them, you blanch them in hot water, you drain them, and uh, just put them in an oven tray and take them out to the sun. Or you can have a homemade uh, solar dryer. Just put a, um, I don't have a very good picture, but it's just a little frame and you put a polythene bag over it and your vegetables inside and you put them out in the sun for eight hours and there you have your dried vegetables and if you don't have a freezer or a fridge you just put those dried vegetables in your cupboard and the whole month you have your dried vegetables uh my final point uh is the good old menu planning Unfortunately, this is where we all, uh, what do you say, stumble. If you don't have a menu and you go shopping, uh, you're going to reach out for foods that are not good for you and you're going to wonder, oh my God, how did I spend so much money and I, didn't, I don't have much money right now? How did I use all this money that I had and there's no food in the house? So always begin by making a menu. From that, you can see where you can, you're not eating well, where your nutritious foods are, where they're not. And from there, you will also see where you're overspending. Next, go make a list, a shopping list. Once you go to the uh, shopping list with, to the uh, supermarket, you will not deviate from there. You will save money. Please, please, that's all I have for you uh, in terms of how to make your family food secure. Uh, do you have any questions? That was short, Mary. Yes, there are questions. You, there are no, questions. You, Alice, you made it, uh, we said we would make it very short to the point. That is very good. That's very good, actually. So there's a question here. Yes. Doesn't blanching deplete the vegetables of the much needed vitamin C? That is uh, by Matilda. Uh, 
that I was expecting that question and the answer is no. If it is done correctly and in those four minutes, you're not going to deplete the vitamin C and all the other uh, water soluble vitamins there. Okay, what we are really doing when we blanch the vegetables is that we are killing the enzymes that cause discoloration. Suppose you cut your skumawiki and you leave it a little bit, uh, maybe a, a few minutes, you'll even begin to smell. It will begin to smell because of the enzymes. So kill, uh, when you pour boiling water, you kill the enzymes. You're not, get, you're not getting rid of the vitamin C. Yes, a little bit is lost, but not much. Mm. Very good question. The next question, how do you check questions here, Alice? Okay, don't worry, I'll read it for you. Yeah. Uh, how about the food, the food supplements? Is it advisable to recommend this to boost immunity during this period? Maybe I'll answer that during when I'm talking about immunity. Uh, okay. Somebody says here, I'm worried about the food access at our main market, which has been closed virtually due to coronavirus. What advice can we tell our clients on the state of their food access? Ah, oh, uh, I think that is a question that can be answered by, uh, I'll say, the policy makers. Um, it's hard to... I know that some markets are closed, others are not closed. Uh, and... Uh, I know also things are different from where you live to where I live. So all I can say is uh, I doubt the supermarkets will be closing. So go to the supermarkets. Uh, really, I don't know how to answer that question. Just do the best you can. Go to the markets, go to the supermarkets. Uh, according to the newspapers and even the policymakers that I've spoken to, the mamambogas will be there. The mamamboggers in your neighborhood will be there. This, they, they give a very important service. They just can't disappear. I, I, I hope I'm answering your question because uh, <laughs> I really don't know. Alice, perhaps okay. you can help me there. Well, I think this is a genuine concern, Mary. Yeah. Deep markets have been closed. And so they're asking, what do we advise people? This means that this is a current problem that's happening right now. So if the markets are closed, there is nothing we can do about it. But it means that you need to advise people to go further. And if it means traveling to buy food, at least we are still allowed to travel. Then they should always get enough to be able to last them a long time. Unfortunately, depending on where you are, Sometimes you'd have, you can only store, you will only be able to eat what you have. I remember a long time ago, I was working with um, Ministry of Health and I was in the committee for agriculture. And they actually had this campaign where they were encouraging people to plant food, to plant vegetables, to plant spices on containers and to put them, you know, it doesn't, you can have a little space, maybe as little as one meter square, but you can plant something there. And I think also because of this uh, corona pandemic, it should remind us that there are some things that we can plant. You can sprout beans, you can plant. So um, unfortunately, if there is no food access in that particular market, they can only go further right now. But it will be good to keep more food. So Mary, I have a question for you. Also, I'll just add to what you've just said. Yeah. Um, uh, and that is uh, ho buying wholesale. I know I can see a lot of students here and uh, money may be an issue. Mm -hmm. But the, what I've re actually pleasantly discovered recently is that if you go to these wholesale uh, people, uh, buying wholesale is actually much cheaper uh, in the long run. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I went to a wholesale and uh, I asked for oh, maybe seven or six kilos of rice and that is enough to feed my family of four for the month 
and uh, and it was actually much cheaper than buying in uh, the supermarket. That was a pleasant surprise. Now I know students, you don't have a lot of money on you right now. It's a mixed crowd, Mary. We have students, we have mothers, we have fathers. Yes, yeah, so I'll say to everybody mm -hmm. that uh, buying wholesale is much cheaper. Thank you. And also buying further. I buy my grains from, uh, I bought one from the supermarket. Um, um, uh, it was cowpeas. It was around 180 shillings a kilo. And when I went to the grain store at Kenyatta Market, it was 110 a kilo. So you can see the difference is 70 shillings. So if you're going to maintain good nutrition at home and cheap, you have got to think about where you're buying your food and what it is that you're buying so that you can save money. Um, uh, uh, somebody says, congratulations, Dr. Mary. And then the other question is, Mary, this is to you. How do you preserve fruits to make it available through, through the seasons? Um, okay. Uh, I talked about drying a bit earlier. And I will just uh, use one fruit that uh, is uh, really making a big uh, impact in our society, and that is mangoes. You'll find mangoes is a big bump crop, and there are mangoes on every corner of your estate and everywhere. Now, uh, then they, they suddenly disappear. But what you find that is uh, entrepreneurs, or even mother, people like you and me, are beginning to dry mangoes if they are all, uh, uh, outside in their flats. So you take a mango or several mangoes, cut them into thin slices, and uh, put on your uh, nonstick oven tray and uh, take them out uh, in, into the sun and put, just put a polythene above them. And this, uh, it, it may create a drying environment for them and preserves the vitamins and you have your dried fruit. Makes sense. So that is one thing I, I would really recommend if we can dry fruit. And you've gone to places, uh, even the supermarket, and you find dried pineapples, dried bananas, dried apples. The, the, the list is endless. So yes, drying is an option. Okay, thank you, Mary. We also have some nutritionists who are actually participating here. And then we also have our dear Professor Akuno. Professor Akuno has a very good idea. Professor Akuno, could you please say what you're saying about this delivery? I'd like you to say it yourself. Alice, you'll pay for this one of these days. I um, will, gladly. <laughs> I, 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 I am one of those who pass by an open air market rather frequently. Mm. And with time, I, I have discovered who gives me a good deal. And mm. therefore with time, I've taken her number. And maybe that is something that most of us could do. You get the contact of your usual or your preferred vendor. Chances are that when the official market is closed, she can st she still has to make a living, so she still has to get some stock. And you can arrange how you could get from her. That that's my very simple um, way out as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, some people have. Um, um, uh, I live in a block. There are about two hundred houses, and some people are actually supplying fruits and vegetables. And even, even like Professor Kuno, I also go by Kenyatta Markets and there's somebody who I buy from. So I just call her and say, I'm coming. I want one, two, three, four. I go, I pick and go. So there's ex no exposure, low exposure, and I've been able to get my fruit. So yes, please get the number of the person who supplies you so they can deliver. And people are actually delivering. Thank you for that, Professor Kuno. Mutegi, our active nutritionist here, you had something to say. It is a long message, but please make it short. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I wanted to relay a message with regards to food security, uh, what uh, professors uh, initiated during this session. Uh, at the moment, we are facing huge disruptions with regards to uh, various dimensions of food security. And specifically now, 
what we have is it's not about if you have you can afford or it's not about the availability of that food affordability or the nutrition nutrition value but it's the vulnerability aspect in which the pandemic has disrupted everything with regards to uh, production up to the consumption uh, mm. and for in my case it's not a question but uh, i think we have seen various programs in other countries. For example, if you look at Bangladesh, they have these cash transfers uh, in terms of directing those cash transfers to uh, food vendors who can be able to deliver certain foods uh, based on the basket to vulnerable groups. For example, targeting uh, poor, poor households in the slum areas very urban slum, as well as rural areas where much of this pandemic has affected. But what we have seen now is there is little effort we can, we can see from the government and even other policymakers. It's all about uh, politics and all things. But the key thing is there are many other aspects and there are many other components in which uh, we can look at in terms of food security. I like the aspect of maintaining, of um, ensuring that you have food sufficiency at the household level, as well as maintaining adequacy. But uh, let's remember the larger groups, um, the larger households in our country, Kenya, and many other countries, uh, those who are earning uh, uh, within poor and uh, middle class levels and to obtain a flow of food sufficiency for, I don't know how many uh, or how many uh, or how long before the lockdown is uplifted, then it means we have to be strategic enough to have solution uh, made uh, uh, immediately or let's say within the course of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we have a participant called Heika. I like what you're saying. Could you please just, uh, on your message, could you please just say it to the group so they can hear your voice and also please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Heika. Did he leave already? Okay, this is, this is the message from Heika. He says, for students to mitigate the cost of food, they can team up like four or five and buy 10 kilograms of rice or grains, then some divide among themselves. This brings down the cost of living during such tough times. I think, I think this is a very good idea, and it's not only for students. Also, we have neighbors who are not able, they're not able to buy as much as and you and me. And so the neighbors can come together, four neighbors, and then they buy um, so many kilos of rice, so many kilos of beans, so many kilos of maize, and then they share among themselves, and this is um, very, very cost effective. Oh, I had, I had muted my mic, sorry. <laughs> oh, I talked for you. Thank so, you. Do you want to say something else in relation to that? I think it was a very good idea. Yeah, you have put it out correctly. Thank you. Okay, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Sure. And then um, I think before we go on to the next, there is something here. Um, um, there was an interesting, this is from Matilda. It says there was an interesting discussion on possibility of contracting COVID-19 uh, from from or through food handling, it will be interesting to hear views on this on this platform. I'd like to call one of my colleagues, um, Lisbeth Karani. Are you there? Could you please comment on this, Lisbeth? She's muted. Huh? Maybe you can unmute for her. Yeah, I've unmuted you, Lisbeth. Hi, 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 everyone. Hi. Hi, everybody. All right. Thanks. Thanks for this uh, educative uh, conference, Dr. Alice and uh, Dr. Mugambi. We really appreciate. So on this issue of food security, mm -hmm. it is quite a challenging issue to even discuss because uh, especially in our country, before even the COVID-19 pandemic uh, knocked in Kenya or even in the world, the country, Kenya in particular, was already facing devastating uh, infestation with the locusts, which had really affected most of the productive uh, lands. 
such that the people who are growing things like in Dengu, those are the arid areas, you know, those such kind of cereals do very well in such areas. They had been infested with locusts. And, and then remember also sometime in October, that was in October 2019, uh, we also experienced uh, excessive rainfall which really affected many, uh, much of the produce that uh, we really depend on to be uh, shipped or rather to be transported uh, to the market. So that in itself already compounded the effect of food security even before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, came up. Uh, but what we need to uh, maybe to think about is uh, we as Kenyans, you know, most of our, uh, our food uh, produce, for example, 10% uh, or our, I mean 90%, we export, uh, we import at least 90% of the rice that we consume. We don't really grow enough of the rice. Even if we have those irrigation places like there, uh, where, where we get rice from, it is never enough to cater for our country. So uh, amidst these lockdowns, then that really puts us in a, in a tight uh, rope whereby when we expect to get rice maybe from Pakistan from, or rather from any other country, then we find that those kind of uh, avenues are already locked down, so we are not able to, to get them. So what are we left with to depend on the 10% that we normally produce amidst these harsh uh, climatic conditions and even the locust infestations and nowadays the narrow beef fly that is also affecting, you know, it's also affecting the vast uh, pieces of land. So that's uh, one of the key challenges that we are having. And uh, still, when we look at the Mamamboga, the, the, the most of those small, small kiosks, to cater for this uh, social distancing, what is happening is that uh, they have to minimize the number of the Mamambogas that are going to the marketplaces such that they have to ensure that they keep the safe distance of maybe 1.5 meter or the two meter distance from one vendor to the other. That mm -hmm. means the mamambogas are faced with a challenge of uh, kind of uh, going to the market in alternate days. That mm -hmm. means you are used to a particular mamamboga who supplies you maybe with the cheap carrots, then you're also at risk because you are not capable of getting that supply uh, frequently because of the kind of uh, uh, the, uh, sanctions that the government is also putting in place. Then when it comes to the imports, because you remember that uh, some of the produce that we have, for example, maize, we import, I mean, we import around 90% of the maize that uh, we have because we have excess. Kenya produces enough maize, so we are capable of importing. Mm -hmm. Then we are also left at a uh, at a standstill, how many of the uh, countries are really willing to pick our maize so that we can have now the economic backflow? That means we have cash flowing back to our country to cater for other issues that maybe to buy other produce that maybe we may not uh, be having in our country. So that's I'm um, looking at uh, this issue of food security, food insecurity. It is really a major challenge in, in terms of. Uh, if we have to have a, a food availability, then how do we increase our productivity? Increasing our productivity means that we have to go to the uh, shambas and plant. Then we have the adequate rainfall at the moment. Are we infested with the locusts whereby when, when we plant our, our produce is eaten? Are the markets open or are they closed such that mm -hmm. delivery of food has already been disrupted? So mm -hmm. at the household level, if we are not very careful, we may be left with very little to benefit from in terms of the food supply. And so majority will end up being food insecure. And that now will automatically narrow down to issues of malnutrition back in the households. So it's really uh, a cycle, a cycle that maybe we may not really know uh, at some point where we are heading to. So what we need to do is maybe the little that we have uh, I may be able to get maybe four or five cartons of the long life milk and I keep it in my house. Someone else depends on their animal, I mean their cow, to, produce, to give him the milk. Yet that cow doesn't have enough of the feed because of the prevailing climatic condition. So it okay. is really 
a, a pull, a push and pull issue on food security. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, let me say that. Okay, thank you very much. I think you, it is, it's long, but uh, we get the point. Food security yeah. is important. And I think what I, what I feel with everybody who's commented is we love everybody. And so we are thinking about everybody else. But today we were interested in just going to your house and, and talking about your food security as the individual who is attending this seminar so that we can, we can actually be able to apply what we are learning to you. Mm. I have a nice comment from Benta. Benta, and this would be maybe we take this last comment and then the other questions we can answer later because we have one more session to discuss on immunity. So uh, Benta, could you please unmute yourself and uh, tell us what you're talking about, uh, food handling and coronavirus? Okay, I've unmuted you. Benta Omonge, please introduce yourself. My name is Benta Omonge, can you hear me? Yes, please. My, my, I'm a registered nurse. Yes. A public health practitioner. Yeah. But looking at um, the, 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 the concern about food handling, mm-hmm. my response was in the fact that um, as a public health requirement, all food handlers are expected, whether there is COVID or not, Mm. to do certain um, tests that, that they do twice a year, mm-hmm. depending on, on the circumstances, to make sure that they don't have bugs in their hands, that they would transmit through food to the, those that consume their food. Uh, and so whether there is COVID or not, uh, the Public Health Act requires that we, we, we regularly have food handlers checked. Mm-hmm. In relation to COVID and what we have learned recently, we've been given very simple steps to make sure that uh, we don't contaminate the foods that we handle in our houses now that we've come back to the household. Yes. And all of us uh, would be able to say that we can certainly be able to access soap and water easily to be able to wash our hands. And, and for the first time in Kenya, every Kenyan knows the six steps to hand washing. It's very impressive when you watch. Yes. And without thinking, you know, completely mm. properly, all the six steps are done. So soap and water would be easy for everybody to hand wash to be able before they, they, you know, they handle their foods. And those who can afford hand sanitizer, although we have been given free samples as well, mm. are also able to sanitize. That mm. alone, you know, if you add to the masks and, and, and uh, vegetable sanitation and all, should be able to make sure that your, 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 your food is not contaminated by, by hands that would then transmit disease to you. Yeah. So mm. really Thank you very much, Benta. I'm so happy that we even have a nurse health professional attending this seminar. Thank you very much. So, of course, what we are getting, there's so much information coming out about uh, food security. There's also issues coming out about hygiene, COVID-19 symptoms. Many things have come up. But um, I think what we want to remember is that um, COVID-19 pandemic has given, has, has, um, has made us think again. Our hygiene, our health, our food, food security. I see somebody is raising their hand. Mr. Lopeli, do you want to say something? I have one minute for you. I just wanted to, I was interested in knowing Kenyans are actually eager to know uh, about the food aid that the president was saying they will help uh, families or who have uh, some stress in accessing food. Mm. And actually waited for quite a long time uh, actually wanted to, to know when is the food mm. reaching them. Mm. So that is something that uh, we want, if possible, these panelists can be able to shed light because they're asking us, mm. uh, we did some registration with the Nobakumi and the other organized group within the uh, household mm. level and they have not gotten such kind of uh, uh, maybe answers. So mm. they're still waiting and the hunger is biting. So what can we do, madam? Okay, thank you for that question. I'll just find out if somebody has a, knows the answer to that question. Please, can you send a message and then we can answer it. In the meantime, I have Yuna Obiero with her hand up. Yuna Obiero, you can go on, please. Hello, and that's everybody. my mom. My name is Yuna. I'm a regular 
I'm no, I'm no nutrition professional. I'm just a regular grandmother and a food lover who likes to have a lot of food at home because I have several children and grandchildren who come by. I've just a quick question. Uh, because of this pandemic, there was advice that we talk a lot on cereals like beans and uh, cow peas and all. So I went out on a, on a big buying spree. But now I'm finding that I have a lot of weevils. Now what should I do to preserve this? Of course, when there's the sun, I use the, the old way of, you know, putting them out in the sun. But is there a way you, you nutritionist, uh, recommend other than using, you know, pesticides to preserve it? Because I've quite a lot of beans and uh, I also got myself some maize to meal. How do you handle cereals? Thank you. I think that's a very good question. Mary, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's your section. Um, but what's her name again? Yuna. 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 Uh, mm. That's a question for the food preservation specialist. Um, but I'll still take a stab at it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a one size fits all when it comes to uh, weevils and these household pests. What I usually recommend to people is get uh, an airtight, once you get at home, get an airtight container and put your cereals inside there. Um, other than that, uh, I guess, um, I really don't know what else I can tell you, but uh, airtight, airtight containers do the trick most of the time. Yeah. I'll okay. Also open the, uh, uh, the floor. Mm. Watch your floor to somebody else who has a different answer, because um, as I said, this is a question for the food preservation experts. Okay. Thank you very much. I see uh, somebody has an answer, but I'll comment. Eh? So usually, if the the grains are dried properly it can take six months to store the grain. But I realize that in our supermarkets, they give you the grains in a plastic bag. So when they give you the grain in a plastic bag and your pantry has a lot of moisture, for some reason, it's going to develop moisture and then it's going to start rotting. So when you, when you get your bag from the supermarket, make holes on it, make holes on it, and then just store it like that or cut one end of it. But um, uh, maybe uh, if somebody has a comment, somebody who works with grains, and there's somebody, Benta says that uh, you can boil, we can boil these cereals and store them in, uh, frozen. Or are you asking a question? Most of the time, uh, you know, you can freeze things for a long time. Given that is not the ideal situation to boil, to store, and to freeze. That is not an ideal situation. And if things are stored for um, a long time without observing some um, storage uh, um, uh, protocol, then they will lose taste. They might not lose value, but they will lose taste. But then also after a certain period, depending on what you're storing, whether it's vegetable, it's fish, then it is also going to lose some value because it's no longer natural. But uh, cereals, if they're not, if they're if they're dried properly, they can store for a long time. And uh, Yuna, we will find an answer for you from uh, this group because we have good experts here. Janet Mala is one of my colleagues, a lecturer at uh, Technical University. Janet, would you like to comment on this, please? I have unmuted you, Janet. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, what you said about the drying of cereals and also freezing is um, a way of uh, preserving um, cereals because uh, you can preserve them and take them in the next season. And uh, for example, I have peas which uh, were there from last season. I had gotten them fresh. Um, Please mute, mute. Okay. Uh huh. Carry on, Janet. And and when I I took them from the shamba, you just freeze them, uh, boil them, freeze them, 
and I'm still eating them. So uh, freezing is one of the ways in which you can preserve. Also, when you get these cereals from the market, just make sure you sort them out, um, dry them in the, uh, or put them out in the sun, and then you put them, you can put them in an air, uh, in a bucket. Mm -hmm. Once you place them in the bucket, they can, they can stay for some time, maybe even six months. So oh, that's what I, yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Also, uh, my favorite uh, Professor Akuno says, my grandmother used to dust the cereals with ash from the fire fireplace and store them for a long time. So that is also something that can work. Yes, thank you. I see Belinda is nodding at me. And I'd like to acknowledge my boss. I just saw him, Professor Orina. I saw you here. Could you please say something? Thank you for supporting us. Where is Professor? I saw him just now. Let me unmute him. Yes. We can't hear you. Maybe a little louder, please. He's, he's working on his sound. Professor Rina, we can't hear you yet. Will you say something? <laughs> okay, okay, we will get back to him a, a little later. Um, I think we have really covered this session very well. We did not expect people to give so much comments, but we will come back. So um, we just have one more subtopic to cover. And now we know that, um, sorry, now we know that we definitely need a whole session on just food security. I'm still, as, I'm still seeing comments coming in, but we will make sure that we answer all the questions. We're just going to make it very, very brief. Mary, do you want to um, say a, um, something before I start the next session, which is on immunity, something completely different? Uh, regarding, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Well, I thought you wanted to say something just to end the session, so we go to immunity. Uh, so I've covered all the four or five topics that I, I wanted to relay about um, making, putting some food on the side uh, for the times that it's scarce, um, how to deal with perishables and drying and uh, menu planning. But I really want to say is that I want to emphasize this is a national, at the national level and the county level, it's really for the government, but for us, if we do those four tips that I gave you, your family and yourself will be at least cushioned from food insecurity. Okay. Thank you very much. We've seen that this pandemic has brought a lot of uh, questions and has made us um, learn and realize uh, that we need to change a lot of things in our life. And one of them is to do with your immunity. So uh, this session, we are going to discuss immunity and we are just going to look at just two habits that make us lose that and how that can affect our life and um, our health. Um, from current slide. So um, your immune system is your body's network of organs, tissues and cells that work together to keep you healthy and fighting off harmful bacteria, viruses, and, um, sorry, sorry about that. I'll take it out of the screen. Yes, so it, it helps you to um, fight the bacteria. And what happens really is that your immune system, it is something that you have to work on now and not later. So we need 
to eat healthy, we need to drink water, we need to eat a variety of food, and we need to do several things over months and years to be able to meet that need. But what happens, we have two types of immune systems. We have what we call the aggressive immune system and we have a smart, a smart immune system. Aggress aggressive immune system is, um, what happens is when somebody gets sick, so you try to take nutrients and you try to take other things, but what happens is your immune system can attack you and that is what can cause death. Just to make the story short, because we don't want to start using uh, words like T cells and cytokines. So I'll just make it simple. But a smart immune system is the immune that is going to protect you. And this immune system, how is it developed? It is developed over a long period of time when you actually practice good habits. So let's just look at two habits that I have realized over practicing nutrition for the last 20 years and talking to many people that affects you and affect your immune system. We have taking too little at the wrong time and taking too much at the wrong time. What do I mean by that? What I mean is when you eat, it's eating very little at breakfast and eating too much food at night. On a normal day, you wake up in the morning to go to work. You need more energy. And then you are going home to sleep at night. You need less energy because you're going to sleep. So you actually need more energy during the day and you need less energy at night. And that is what nature requires. But because of our lifestyle, what we do is we wake up early in the morning, maybe eat two slices of bread and a cup of tea and go, or completely eat nothing and sit down to work. So what happens is your brain actually needs uh, glucose for in ready glucose for energy. So when you wake up in the morning and you don't eat anything, it means your brain is not using glucose for energy. It's using glucagon, stress hormone. And this, if done over a long period of time, it makes you, you get very tired and very fatigued. So people who do not eat breakfast, at the end of the day, they're likely to have a headache and they are going to be extremely tired. And uh, of course, this is a bad habit. If it goes on for a long time, it becomes a problem. It becomes a health risk. You can end up getting burned out. And then maybe these same people also, what happens is, they come home in the evening, of course they are tired, they have a headache, and they're very, very hungry. So you end up eating a lot of food. Because you're hungry, you have a larger portion of food than before. So what happens? Now, you have food, there's a lot of glucose from the food, your brain is active. So that definitely is going to interfere with your sleep, so you're not going to rest. And also if you eat your meat and your fish and your chicken at night, these proteins are digested, the animal proteins and fats are digested over a long period of time. So maybe if you're a disciplined person, you eat at eight, digestion is six to seven hours. That means at one o'clock you're still digesting. If you eat at 10 o'clock, which is the habit of most corporate Kenyans, lecturers who work late, they're doing research, doctors, corporate Kenyans, they come home, 10 o'clock is news time, you start want to start eating at 10.30, and then, so, if you eat at 10 o'clock and your food is being digested for seven hours, what happens? Count 10 o'clock, seven hours. It means by the time you're waking up in the morning, you actually have not rested. Your body was busy digesting. And remember, when you're sleeping at night, there is digestion, and of course, there is excretion of nutrients. There is rejuvenation of the whole system. So the process is restoring your immune excretion of, you know, stress hormone, viruses, bacteria. It's not happening. So it eventually affects your immune. So to make it short, you're always tired in the evening because you don't eat breakfast. You're very tired in the morning because you're eating a large meal and not sleeping properly. If this goes on for a long time, do you have a normal immune system? Of course not. Are you emotionally stable also? Of course not. When you're always tired, imagine you do this, you come home at night, 
Can you even talk to your family? For those who are married, can you meet your nicely duties or obligations to your spouses? So just not eating breakfast and eating too much at nine causes a lot of problems. So this is what I've seen. When you don't eat, when you eat too much at night, you're going to get, you're always going to have fatigue and you're not going to have, you don't have enough rest. When you don't eat breakfast, you still get fatigue, frequent headaches, and low immune system. And this low immune system affects everybody. The other thing you interfere with when you don't eat breakfast and eat a large dinner is your circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is just your night, your clock that tells you it's time to go to bed. It's at night. It's time you should go to bed. Or it is, um, so, and, and this, it is very good when we have a circadian rhythm, which means that every time, uh, maybe at nine o'clock, you start dozing. It's time to go to bed every nine o'clock. If you have a rhythm like that, that's very good. But what happens, because a lot of us work late hours, take too much food at night, we are, look, we are using our phones and looking at the light for very, very long hours. Then it interferes with our circadian rhythm. So you actually go to bed, you're not even sleepy. And so yes, you sleep, but you do not get to what we call the rapid eye movement. You do not get to the section where you are deep asleep that your body is resting. And of course, the result of that is a poor immune system, fatigue, risk of hypertension, risk of obesity, risk of diabetes. And also, if you already have these conditions, you have diabetes, you have hypertension, you have high cholesterol, and you're not sleeping properly, and you're not doing the basic, then definitely, you are not going to, you are going to worsen the medical conditions. Um, the other thing is that people don't manage is exercise. A lot of people, my favorite saying is this, if you can't make time for exercise, be ready to make time for illness. This saying was as old as 1873, that's a long time ago. And what I, what I added is, and use your hard-earned money to pay your medical bills. Because most people say, I don't have time. I don't have time. We have 24 hours a day. All you need is 30 to 45 minutes. And believe me, anything you do for your own body, exercise eating is for you. The rest of the things you do are not yours. When you go to work, it's not for you. You're working for somebody else, but your body. So people don't exercise. And when you don't exercise, that is just room for more trouble. So we've just looked at two, three, two habits that affect everything. Eating too little at the wrong time and eating too much at the wrong time. So what is the recommendation for all this? My recommendations has an acronym which is free with three E's. So the first thing we have to do is be free of toxins. Be free of toxins. What is your toxin? What toxin do you consume? Is it alcohol? Is it sugar? Like you take too much of it. Is it, um, is it coffee? What is your toxin? What is the one thing that you take too much of? So identify what your toxin is and remove it. Some of my clients told me when they, Eat, when they don't eat breakfast, a lot of them come, they always take Panadols every day. Every day they're taking a painkiller. And then you are always tired and fatigued. You feel sick. You go to the hospital, they run a long test and they find nothing. And the problem is you're not sleeping enough, you're not eating breakfast, and you're eating too much at night. So what is your toxin? Is it too much? What are you taking too much of? Just remove it. So free of toxins. The second one is R, rehydrate, drink water. Every second of our life, your body needs water to excrete uh, waste, to, to uh, help in circulation of oxygen, nutrients. Water is very important and we should distribute water through the day. This theory of waking up to take five glasses of water and then first the day, that is very wrong and completely dangerous. So the third thing we have to do is letter E. Eat healthy, 
And what is eating healthy? Eat a variety of foods. Eat your fruits, eat your vegetables. We all know how to eat healthy, but maybe that will be discussion for another day. But for now, no, you need to eat your starches, you need to eat your vegetables, you need to eat your fruits, and you need to eat your seeds, and you need to eat your spices. Just eat what's available to you, and always how much. The second E is you need to exercise. Just remember, if you can't make time for exercise, be ready to make time for illness. The third E is have enough rest. You need to sleep seven to eight hours. You, that is very important. And how do you make sure you sleep efficiently? When you wake up in the morning, if I was to put all of you in a camp, I would give you your breakfast, your dinner for breakfast. That large meal I'll give you in the morning. In the evening, I'll give you little food so that you can digest it and be able to sleep. So avoid animal proteins at night. And especially if you're 55 years old and uh, hypertensive, then you should not touch even the beans, even the plant protein at night because it increases your, your, um, your filtration rate. And that increases, that means that your blood pressure is at night. So do not take your proteins at night. Take them in the morning or during the day. And last but not least, manage stress. Stress, you should manage it. Talk to somebody, see a psychologist, just manage stress. So um, what do I want you to take home? Free, F-R-Triple-E-S. Free of toxins, rehydrate, eat healthy, exercise, have enough rest, and manage your stress. And last but not least, just remember, if you can't make time for exercise, be ready to make time for illness. Thank you very much. I believe, Alice, if we could clap for you, for here we would. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. So do you have any questions for Alice? Or any comments? I see a friend of mine has joined from the United States of America. Dr. Yonette Thomas, would you like to say something, please? Um, I want to say, Alice, um, I also clap for you. I'm so delighted of this August gathering. Um, this is so much needed. And what you said, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can what hear you. What you said was precise to the point and well defined without um, a lot of jargon. Um, the next round, I want you to talk about that stress level and how mm -hmm. stress impacts nutrition or cortisol levels, what impact that has as, as people of the diaspora, what we need to be paying attention to. And I like the fact that you're talking to um, up and down the, the classes. And mm -hmm. I think as people who are better off, uh, who are in the professional class to some extent, we also need to talk to ourselves because we tend to say it's for the people we share them, but we don't practice it. If mm -hmm. we're not healthy or the people who depend on us cannot be healthy. And I, I see there are a considerable number of men in the group and a considerable number of women Mm -hmm. And I want to articulate the fact that women play an integral role in ensuring nutrition in families and communities in societies, because when women are healthy, everybody is healthy. And I'll shut up. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I was looking for Professor Orina to say something. Professor Orina, I don't see him. Um, yes, Professor Orina. Um. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. I expect that if you do not exercise, then you prepare to, to get sick. <laughs> uh, not, we, when we do not have the normal schedule for work. So it's 
very easy for for somebody right now <laughs> without. So it's important for for our team to take time and exercise so that we when when we get back to the normal routine we find we find you healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, I just on behalf of on my on behalf of myself and uh, and the school, I, 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 I I'll say I'll commend the Alice and and uh, Mary for for this initiative and encourage people to ask more questions. Maybe just to to wind up, uh, I'll ask one question. Mm. Um, do you is, is there a specific way that we are supposed to eat every day. You said uh, you, we are supposed to have more breakfast and then uh, less food as the day goes on. Is there a specific uh, way this is supposed to be done that you can you can educate us on? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Rina, for that. Um, um, is there a specific way that we should eat? Um, I, I will try to answer that question in a few ways. There is no specific food that you need to eat, but you need to, and I'm sure, okay, so there's a specific way of eating. As the day grows, as you wake up in the morning, remember, you've been fasting for seven to eight hours. You haven't eaten since the night before. So breakfast means that we need to break the fast. And when we use the word fast, it means you've been fasting for long hours. So you need something tangible to break the fast. When you take something like bread, and most people like to eat white bread, it's going to last you very few minutes. Yes, it becomes glucose, that glucose is used up, but it's gone in a few minutes, 30 minutes or less. So we encourage always to try and eat whole foods. So when we say whole foods, as whole as Jehovah God created it, like your sweet potato is whole. Things like beans make good breakfast. I remember when we were growing up, we would eat gideri, maize and beans cooked together. That is maize and your starch. That is, that is a lot heavier and a lot cheaper than your tea and bread. If you eat even just groundnuts, a handful of groundnuts and porridge, that is going to last you a good four to five hours. So what we are trying to say is please do not eat nothing for breakfast. Try and add something to your breakfast. And it is much cheaper to eat your natural food as much as as you can. And then also in the evening, sorry about that, uh, there's a trade passing outside my house. I'll just... Unmute again. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Sorry, that was the train. The train passes right outside here, so it was very loud. Um, I even almost lost my thought. Yes, so what I'm saying is your animal protein, your meat, your chicken, your fish, is digested for longer hours. So it is not safe for you to eat it at night because it means instead of sleeping, when you're supposed to be sleeping, the body is digesting. During digestion, there is heat production, there is glucose production, so it means your brain is active, And because of the heat related to digestion and many other processes, which I don't want to say here, it interferes with your rest. So then you're not able to sleep properly. So my my call to you and all those who are listening and would like to have a healthier lifestyle, a better immune system, please eat your, if you eat meat in in the evening, eat it for your breakfast. Because it's digested seven to eight hours, it means if you eat it at eight o'clock for your breakfast, it's going to last you seven to eight hours. So you're going to be hungry at two o'clock. That prevents you from snacking because you don't snack, you're, you're, you're full and you'll be eating because it's time to eat. And if you, if you have a better breakfast, you feel better at the end of the day. And... Um, I hope I've answered your question, Professor Rina. But so now if all of, if we need individual uh, advice and then now we can come up and ask. 
Matilda, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Alice, for this opportunity. So I just wanted you to speak to, um, you know, the special groups that we have within our families. So we have people who uh, have immune issues. We have those who are pregnant. We have children under five who are uh, picky eaters. And, uh, you know, we are trying to keep them as healthy as possible, especially during this um, COVID-19 period. So a little uh, bit of tips here and there of how we can be able to, to support if they are new and strong. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need help. Janet Mala, uh, Lisbeth Karani, Susan Wairegi, all those are my colleagues from nutrition department. So Mary, would you like to say something? Janet Mala? Um, I'll just begin by saying that um, you mentioned how do you improve your your in, immune system for the whole family? Is that correct? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. What I usually tell people is that the more colorful your plate, the more nutrients you have that boost your immunity. I was going to uh, finish with a, 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 a picture here. Let me see if I can get it. And I'll, you can tell me if you can see it. But don't finish it. There are questions. Uh, yeah, it's just one uh, uh, picture. Mm. Uh, can, you, can you see it? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, I can uh, see it. If you, okay. If you can make your plate as colorful as this, red, orange, yellow, green, the more uh, uh, vitamins and minerals are there, what we call <coughs> antioxidants, that really improve your immunity. So I would really recommend that if you can get as much of your food supply or your meals to be as colorful as this one plate is, then your immunity, immunity will improve in the long run. Uh, that is all I have to say. So the more fruits, the more vegetables you eat, the much better you're or you're better off. Uh, then I would also encourage you to eat more nuts and seeds like Dr. Alice said. Uh, they have also lots of anti uh, antioxidants like vitamin E and you, they actually help the body much better. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Alice, back to you again. Okay, so I... I don't know if you can see this plate here. <laughs> so this plate, Mary, get out. <laughs> so this plate is divided into, it's a normal plate. Um, this is the length. The length, the width of your plate is this long, usually the size of your fingers. And so half of this plate is vegetables and you have a quarter of it is your protein and then the other quarter is your starch. So if you want to maintain your weight, the best, best way is always to make sure that half of your plate is vegetables. Most of the time when people eat, they take up the plate, they heap it with your rice and starch, then you put some protein, and then you put a teaspoon of vegetables. It should always be the other way around. Arrange your plate. Half of it is vegetables. And um, uh, uh, was it a benta? You asked a very nice question. We cannot be able to answer specifically what you have to do with children and everybody else, but those are the basics. Those are the basics. Always make sure there's a fruit in, in the child's diet every, every day. It can be one, it can be two, depending on what's available to you. Make sure they eat breakfast, Make sure they eat dinner. Also, children should eat dinner as early. This is what I tell parents. Now children are not going to school, and I, Professor Rina said something about taking the, this opportunity to, to, to exercise and to eat healthy, and I'll just mention that. Children are not going to school, but what I used to tell my clients is, when the children come from school at 4 o'clock, please give them the dinner that you are prepared for them. What happens is most parents, when the children come from school, they are given tea and bread, and then they have to go do their homework, and then they have to play. But by the time it's time to eat dinner, which has got their vegetables and the nutrients that they need, or maybe their starch and that protein, then they're too full to eat, and then it becomes a fight. 
So if you have children who go to school, when they come from school, four o'clock, give them their dinner. When they're going to bed at eight or nine, feel free to give them a fruit. Then you will take care of their, of their health. And your children, the, your chi all of us should, have, uh, should always strive to have a better immune. When you eat healthy, you don't fall sick. When you eat healthy, you prevent, uh, you, you don't get infections, malaria, typhoid, you do not. And even if you get an infection or you get a viral infection, like you get a flu, you will just be sick for one day or two days. But when you don't eat properly, you don't sleep properly, you don't exercise, when you get sick, you're staying in hospital for five days. I think that's very expensive or even longer. The child is sick, they have to be on antibiotics, they have to be on hospital, mother is in hospital, father is in hospital, and they're always sick. It's expensive for the family, it's emotionally draining. A lot of people don't visit nutritionists or dietitians, but this is our recommendations. I think I've talked too much. I'll give Janet Mala an opportunity to say something. Janet is one of my colleagues. She's a lecturer and a, a nutritionist in the Department of Human Nutrition and Dietetics. Janet, please go ahead. Unmute her, unmute her. I'm trying to. <laughs> Unmute yourself. I've tried. Yes. It's refusing. I've done it. Okay, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, whatever you've said is very correct. And what Mary has said about the plates being colorful, that is um, quite excellent. Um, the thing I wanted to say is that uh, you also need to make these um, nutrients from the foods that we are eating available in the body. And... Um, one of the simple methods that we can do is uh, actually to check on the methods of cooking. How do you cook your foods? But that can be a discussion for another day because um, how the foods are cooked will affect also um, how you are going to preserve these nutrients and make them available in the body so that they can help in, uh, in the building up of the immune system. So also you can also um, check on the health status. Uh, the health status of also of a person will uh, also determine on how these nutrients are uh, used in the body so that they can be able to um, give immunity in the, in, the, in the body. That is all I can say. Thank you. And mute yourself, Alice. Thank you, <laughs> Susan Wairegi. Susan, are you here? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you and Dr. Mugambi for this nice conference that we are having now. Um, secondly, I want to comment about the immune system. Uh, You've talked about nutrition, about the foods, the colorful plate, uh, and so on. I also want to mention that uh, stress, stress, uh, high stress levels can also negatively impact our immune system. Uh, our lifestyles today uh, are actually very stressful in many ways for most of us. Uh, even amid this uh, lockdown of uh, COVID-19, we are seeing uh, many people suffering from high levels of stress. We are actually uh, getting uh, rates of suicide being uh, recorded very high. So the so stress levels right now are very high. And, um, uh, and one way of beating this stress is to ensure that um, we are more active physically, uh, because even being active, when we have proper physical activities, we're also going to uh, boost our immune system and also lead better lives. So one way is to ensure that we are active. We should um, uh, we should lead more like uh, active lifestyle. Stop being uh, too docile in the homes or too sedentary. You know, doing nothing much in the house. 
we can do some exercises in the houses or we can jog, walk around. That can be the stress levels or can bring down the stress levels that most of us are having. And now we can also have a better improved uh, immune system. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. So I just want to pick up something and then we go to stress. Um, uh, Professor Rina had said, um, had suggested something. Right now we are on lockdown, schools are closed. Uh, we have another 21 more days, so another three weeks. So take this opportunity to improve your sleeping habits, to exercise, and to improve your eating habits. So do that. Um, now, we've talked about exercise, ex we've talked about stress, but we did not have the capacity in this group to talk about stress. Uh, Dr. Yonet uh, Thomas has suggested that next time we need to manage stress. But I have a friend who is a psychologist and she has joined this meeting. She's all the way from United States. She's called Shatia Blount. Shatia, could you just comment on how stress affects the immunity and what we can do right now? In short, thank you for joining us. Hi, sorry I'm late. Um, thank you, Alice. I, I am not a psychologist, I want to clarify. I am a um, licensed clinical social worker and I'm also a um, psychotherapist. So I do- Psychotherapist, yes. Mental health. Uh, and yes, stress does depress the, uh, the immune system and uh, make you more susceptible to uh, disease in the body or sickness and as the woman spoke earlier, exercise and movement is very important in helping you to um, manage stress physically, but oftentimes um, stress is induced by what we're thinking and how we're thinking about things. So oftentimes there is a lot of work to be done in reframing uh, thoughts that lead to continuous stressful behavior and, and, and worry. So it's um, a lot of times there's a lot of talk about kind of mindfulness, um, thinking about what's in your area of control versus things that are out of your control. Uh, so really focusing on what you have control over really helps to decrease some of the stressors, uh, especially when there's a pandemic and larger things happening, kind of focusing in on your immediate needs and bringing yourself to, I like to call like a radical awareness, right? So if you have to be aware of what's happening in the very second with you, you will notice that, you know, okay, I'm okay, I'm alive, I'm breathing, you know, bring, being very present um, seems to be very helpful when you're having uh, a lot of stress, um, especially around things that you don't have immediate control over in the moment. So that's, that's my input. Okay, thank you very much. Being in control, like, yes, I can control this, I can't control this. So accept what you can control, and what you can't control, give it. Thank you very much, Shatia. Next time we'll have a conference on stress and maybe we'll invite Shatia. So right now I have, we have a health professional, Benta. What can you say about stress and immunity and just with your experience as a nurse professional? Thank you very much for being here. Benta Omonge. Thanks for allowing me again. A lot has been said already, mm. but um, uh, stressful situations, as has already been mentioned, actually contribute quite a lot to, to, to your, to, you know, to, to putting down our immune system. Uh, because when, when one has a lot of things going on um, in their lives that are causing them stress, then more often than not will not partake of all this good advice we've had. They will not eat well, they will not eat in time, they will not sleep well. And so all these things just add up to the fact that um, all those will affect how your how your health how your health health overall is, and therefore affect your immune system as well. When you're stressed, you'll find you catch very simple uh, uh, small uh, illnesses very easily. You get a flu here, you get because you're always tired, you haven't slept, you haven't eaten, you haven't hydrated. Yeah. yeah. So the fact that um, stress levels are, 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 are something that we go through all the time, even our jobs as, as it is, would be areas that cause us stress. In some very fast-paced uh, jobs, uh, for example, if I may just work with what the hospital is, is like now, with the 
fact that we have lots of patients that are there either waiting for tests um, to be done on COVID or positive for COVID. And, and so those that are looking after those patients are so highly stressed. They have no time to think about themselves. They're not taking their usual teas. They're not resting. They're worried. They're distressed. And so they can very easily pick up infections as well because that does affect their immune system. So those two are, are, are you know, like one, like a vicious circle, when, when one isn't being taken care of, it affects the other. Uh, and when you're able to work out your stress level so that you're less stressed, then you're able to remember that you need to eat, you need to rest, you need to sleep. And so that takes care of your, your general immunity and, and so less, less infection for you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Benta. Now, I'd like to ask um, two people. We have older people in this group. They're not senior citizens, but they're older and they have experience. So, uh, Professor Akuno, I'm sorry to ask this of you, but in short, how have you managed stress and what can you tell the young ones about stress management? Because you have a lot of young people here. Thank you. Alice, thank you, senior citizen, almost. Um, <laughs> I discovered that I'm, I'm old enough to decide what to allow to stress me. Mm -hmm. um, the, mentioned earlier, the day has 24 hours. There are certain things that I must do. There are also certain things that I, I want to do. There are also things that I would like to do. I think much of our stress for those of us who report to somebody else mm -hmm. uh, is based on, the, on meeting the expectations. My perception of my ability to meet those expectations, my perception of, of failure, I do not want to fail. Mm -hmm. However, with all of these jobs that we have with all of these responsibilities that we have at any given time there is what is important but there's also what is urgent mm -hmm. so to mm -hmm. sort out to manage to push stress as far away from me as possible i often am forced to categorize my responsibilities for the day so i'll deal with mm -hmm. what is extremely urgent and without forgetting the ones that are important that, that support those ones that are urgent. And then one mm -hmm. thing that, that I learned very recently was that I am human. <laughs> I finally discovered <laughs> that I am human. <laughs> and so number one, it is possible and okay for me to fail. But mm -hmm. number two, I must take care of my body. One of the things that I learned also is that this job that I'm doing I exit, somebody else comes in. Mm -hmm. But my mm -hmm. parenting, my sistering, my daughtering, I exit, nobody replaces me. So mm -hmm. I must take care mm -hmm. of myself in order to take care of those responsibilities. So this, these issues that you're talking about, about nutrition, really mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. yourself so that you can take care of those responsibilities, I think, I think it is crucial. So... Um, the issues of managing stress, ooh, ooh, we, I discover daily that the support system is great and I must take advantage of that. I've got friends on this platform right now and some of them I call just so that we can laugh. Mm -hmm. And that is one way of, of getting rid of that stress. So as Heika mentioned, I think Heika and Kogos mentioned exercise. That is one way of relieving part of that stress. But sometimes just doing something that you don't have to do, but that you're doing for yourself, just to make yourself feel good. Those are, the, those are some of the ways that I, I try to handle um, stress. Without uh, passing the buck, without you know, sleeping on the job, without abdicating responsibility, but making time to prioritize, making time to distinguish what is most urgent, what is important, and what really does not have to be done. But also the things that I must do, not nobody else can do. Some of us get to a point where you can actually, um, what is the word? What is the <laughs> word? Delegate. Mm. Where we can actually delegate. So we need to trust the people around us enough so that we can give them some of the work to handle and we don't just keep crowding ourselves with things day in, day out. Have I said enough? Yes, thank you very much, Professor. For me, for me the, the most important, Alice, mm -hmm. 
the yes. most important. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and I, I said the word trust. Mm. There's trusting our colleagues, ETC, but above all for me, it's trusting God. Because Thank I know you. he cares for me and he handles much of what I, I'm worried about. Thank you very much. Okay, Bye. I said there are two older people here. Thank you very much, Professor Kuno. Yuna Obiero, you talked about grandchildren, grandparents. How do you handle st stress? I also know that you have a high level uh, job. So how do you handle stress? Grandchildren, work, and corona. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's putting me on the spot. I'm no stress expert. So I'll just tell you the little things I try to do. Mm -hmm. I, um, to deal with them, I have little tips like, uh, I like wine. So sometimes <laughs> I, I, I overindulge. So I know I must reduce on, on my intake of wine. So that has helped. Previously, I would uh, have very little physical activity. But now I've started a regular regime thanks to the lockdown. I walk for about an hour around my estate. So indulging again in physical activity helps. I'm sleeping more and I find if I sleep more, uh, well, lack of sleep for me was, I think maybe work, but now I'm able to sleep a little bit more. And then uh, another thing I try to do is talk to someone, look for a trusted, mature friend, and then uh, offload, you know, share my concerns, my, my issues. So by talking to someone about certain matters that are of concern to me, helps me a lot in, um, in managing uh, uh, stress. And like the previous speaker has said, being older, I've learned to take control of issues. Eh? I said stress, you're not going to deal with me. I will, I have learned to find solutions of dealing with problems as they come head on, you know, so that I don't let uh, stress take control. Mm. Another thing that I've recently started, the last one is, um, I'm keeping a, a journal. I'm writing a little diary, a daily journal of, uh, what have I called it? In fact, today I was uh, looking at it. I have said, uh, what did I call it? Lockdown. Well, it's, this is slang, but it's a journal on lockdown. Manenos, my experience with lockdown, all the issues I've dealt with, who, what we've gone through. I've lost certain relatives, uh, the feelings I'm going through. So I find that by documenting this and putting it down, it's a little bit helpful and maybe one day when I look at it and I think, wow, I, I wrote all that. And uh, these are the, 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 the little ways that I'm finding uh, that are helping me deal with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, we've said and said and said, but now we have got to end the session. So shortly we have a few minutes, but I just wanted to say something. Uh, recently, I lost uh, members of my family, and I was down. And you can be down with stress. Corona was not even stressful. It is now sudden loss of family members. And for two weeks, I could not do anything. And then I woke up one day and called my boss, and I had a conference for students. And then Mary, my friend, said, we're not canceling this one. We are going to do it. So you have got to get out of your stress. We know many people are being as stressed for so many things. And uh, of course, Corona is the biggest stress of all. And from Corona, we've realized if you're unhealthy, you have a low immune system, you have not been saving, having uh, man practices, you've not been having good nutrition practices, you've not been having good relations practices, now you're locked up with people, it's very high stress level. And I think just like Dr. Yonet um, uh, suggested, and some of you, and also Shatia, I think our next conference will be on stress. And we will actually invite the experts to talk to us how we can deal with stress. You will look out for this. Yonet has something to say. So maybe uh, she can say something, and then we can I, give over to uh, Mary to close the session. I just want to say, uh, our uh, distinguished colleague who just spoke, um, raised on some very important aspects of managing um, the life of being a professional, being a parent, 
um, being whatever you are, this issue of sleep and studies show that sleep plays a, a very important role in our ability. Um, Dr. Alice talked about the body being able to rejuvenate during a period of time of resting. Deep sleep facilitates, allows the metabolism to rest, to re to re re-energize and and um, and allows the brain to settle and resolve issues of the day. So in addition to stress, I want you to next time talk about cortisol levels and how it impacts stress, the, mm. meta- um, the biochemistry of that, but sleep is very important. And one more thing our distinguished colleague just said that was critically important is the role of writing, journaling. Journaling, we're finding the studies are showing, is helping the individual to articulate things that are in the subconscious that they haven't been able to express. And it's, a, and it's an, in, in, a, an amazing way of, of um, settling, solving, re, re, rejuvenating. So um, my distinguished colleague, I didn't get your name. You hit Yuna, two she's called major, Yuna. 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 Um, yes. Two major things. You're not an expert, but by golly, you gave the expert advice. Sleep and journaling, very important. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. So I want to hand over to Mary to make the closing remarks. But Mary, just before I forget, I'd like to say thank you to my friends from US, Shatia Blount and Dr. Thomas Yonet, who is my mentor. I am so privileged that you're here. Also, Professor Akuno, thank you so much for being here. It was a big surprise. And my boss, Professor Orina, was here. I think he left. So I am, I am so, uh, thank you for supporting me. And you just gave me more fire so that we can do more for the community. So Mary, over to you. Um, thank you, Alice, for giving me this chance to give the vote of thanks to our conference goers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I met Alice more than 20 years ago. <laughs> and I was struck just uh, by her energy and her passion for nutrition and educating people. And this was her initiative. This conference was her idea. And you can see just how passionate she is. It's come out so, so, so clearly. So Alice, I really want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so, so, so much for this. Uh, then I'd like to uh, thank uh, Professor Orina and uh, Professor Akuno, our seniors. Uh, your presence means a lot to us. And then I'd also like to thank our colleagues at the Technical University, the Department of Human Nutrition. You joined us. Thank you very, very much. And then I would also thank our international guests. Uh, from far away, you said they are from US. That is a big boost. Really, thank you so much. And uh, to do, uh, as we are experts in you, uh, agree with me. I myself have learned so much just from listening from all the experts that represented here. Uh, thank you so, so much. Alice and I were exploring uh, if we should do another conference like this one. And we said, oh, we really don't know. We really don't know. But it's so yeah that we really need to do another one. And you just said it, we'll do on stress among other topics. So uh, so Alice, uh, over to you to close it up. Mm. So I just want to say thank you very much for coming and um, we will uh, get back to you. Uh, we, we saw some questions that we're not able to answer. We'll try to see what to do about it. So Mary, I'll just ask you to put the email address so that uh, they can take it down and then they can share the email and then we call it a day. So um, we want to thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Please tell your friends. Next conference is on stress and we will tell you when it will be. If you send us an email, we will always let you know what's happening and what's going on. Thank you very much.
this is our email. Uh, mine is nkmugambi at. I can't see it, Mary. Not yet. Oh, oh, it's showing. It's there. It's there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can see. Okay. <laughs> it's showing. It's showing. It's there. Okay. Okay. So my email is nkmugambi at gmail dot com, and for Alice, it's dietitian at aliceofmindphd dot com. Welcome uh, all your comments, all your feedbacks, any questions you may have. Nothing is very small for us. So please, please uh, contact us. Okay. Thank you so much. And how do I? Okay. Stop sharing. <laughs> okay. And I think we forgot to thank some young people in the team. I have some uh, young uh, students who are helping oh, me with co hosting. Yeah. Stephen and Kelvin, thank you very much, my students. They're third year students and they are really coming up. And thank you all the students who joined the session. We will be there to support you to take your nutrition career to the next level. But just remember, you also have to live a healthy lifestyle. Then I will work with you. There's no use telling everybody eat healthy, you're eating junk. Sleep better, you're not sleeping. Exercise, you're not. So now, um, you can unmute yourself if you want to say something, and you can also leave the meeting. The meeting is over. We have a few minutes to interact. If you'd like to say hi to people, and thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. So, um, hi, Alice, and uh, thank you for the meeting. I mm -hmm. came late, but uh, actually benefited. Thank you all. Oh, this is Sean. Sean. Sean, yes. oh, nice yes. to see you here. Oh, I didn't see you. I would have asked you to say something. But next time, thank you very much for being All here. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm looking for someone to show their face. I would like to see Janet. Where is Marla? Guys, Marla? put on your cameras now. You can put on your cameras. Okay. Let's see you. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alice, well done. This is very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, All your support too, Mary. It would not have been good without you. It is so much better with all of you. Yes, I can see everybody. Show your faces, everybody. Meeting is over. Locking down shortly, but show your faces. <laughs>